This graduation day punctuates a year of hard work and accomplishment by our graduates, a year that really, really matters. Across the great professions within the United States, this might be the only one, or certainly one of a few, that invests a full year in the individual preparation of its experienced strategic leaders for what is to come. Perhaps that's a clear recognition of the compelling purpose behind service to nation here in our United States government the Department of Defense, and across the 75 countries represented by our 80 international fellows today. The assignments that await you today speak to an immediate leap in responsibility. And while we're a combined and joint program, you need to look no further than where our Army students are headed off to, to grasp the opportunity for impact that each of you now have. 52 into command this year or next, 20, 24 to service in global combatant commands, major army commands, and theater armies. 54 to joint and interagency assignments in the field or to the Pentagon for service at service headquarters, the joint staff, and in the Office of Secretary of Defense. And I could go on. When you look back at this year, I hope you'll realize this was the year to exercise your own agency, make your own choices as to what to study, what to research, how to experience our academic requirements, and how to balance your life among family, social, and athletic priorities. And after years in which your service called the shots, this year we ask you to be active decision makers in your own academic experience. We're proud of you and we're excited to see how you'll flourish in your future responsibilities. And you leave here with our faith in you and our prayers for you. Now it's my distinct pleasure to introduce our graduation speaker, Lieutenant General Xavier Brunson. General Brunson is the commanding general of First Corps, one of only four corps headquarters in our United States Army. He was commissioned as an infantry officer upon graduation from Hampton University in 1990, where he earned a Bachelor of Arts in Political Science. He also holds a Master of Arts in Human Resources from Webster University and a Master in Strategic Studies from our very own United States Army War College, Seminar 23, I'm told. General, uh, General Brunson has served at every level of command up to Corps across his 32-year career with multiple deployments to Iraq and Afghanistan. Eight years ago, I sat where you are, eight short years ago. And I hope that the words that I share with you today might inspire you as you move forward from here and lead, no matter what you're going to do. I think it's fair to say that our Army and albeit our joint and multinational forces, we are moving out. And I think that based on what I've seen and what I've heard over my 32 years, that some of you have been studying specifically as it relates to the Indo-Pacific. And as the only Army Corps, which is assigned to a combatant command, we've added strategic and operational context to everything that we're doing. We're far busier than we've ever been. I've been traveling around the region, visiting our partners and viewing our exercises and training. And it's important for all of us to help people better understand what our army, what our joint force is doing in that region. I'm sure you've studied integrated deterrence as mentioned by Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin, but my part of that is not necessarily integrated deterrence. There is no triad that's resident within my headquarters. I can't do classic deterrence, but what I can do for our friends, partners, and allies is assure them that we'll be present. That's my part of it. That's what I can affect across the operational continuum. And when we look at integrated deterrence, it's a thing that my boss often says, General Flynn. He talks about capability and messaging and will and posture. By way of capability, it's making sure that our partners understand things like our new formations, like the multi-domain task force, it's that they understand the Arctic capabilities resident in the 11th Airborne Division. It's that they might understand that agile combat employment right, might require multi-domain operations to be a real thing. It's partnering with the joint force to ensure 
that we're able to demonstrate the best capabilities of our forces. Messaging is not seeking credit for things that we're doing in a region like the Indo-Pacific, but it's acknowledgement of the fact that we've got to be present there. Our Secretary of the Army, the Honorable Christine Warmuth, says that the Army is the linchpin of the joint force going forward, especially as it relates to the Indo-Pacific. And our posture just equals presence. It's being there. And our will is demonstrated by the fact that after 20 years of capital M leading the way, military solutions to every problem, it might be time for a smaller M to move forward while diplomacy and information and economics take a leading role for our nation. And when you read the news, you know that readiness of our military is just as important now as, it, as it's ever been. Russia continues the war with Ukraine and we are actively competing in the Pacific. Competition across the dime is the way of the future and the future is now. We're doing multi-domain operations. That's our operating concept in the Army. We're experimenting, we're rapidly moving forward while still in contact. And within my own Corps, the 25th ID, the 7th Infantry Division, the 11th Airborne Division, we've been training all over the world as in the Indo-Pacific. India, Singapore, Thailand, Indonesia, Malaysia, the Philippines, Japan, Australia, among others. Our soldiers are truly deployed. But better said, they are engaged in the region. Like no other army in the world, we are engaging globally. We are reinforcing and expanding our support in Europe. We're staying consistent in our relationships in the Pacific. But we're doing all those things across our joint force because one thing always remains true, that people want to have free and open regions where countries have the ability to make their own choices without coercion from others. When I think about what we do across the globe, it makes me very proud to serve. But at the same time, I think about how tough our tasks are. But there's hope. That hope is resonant in the chairs before me right now. You future strategic leaders, you'll move off from this place. And we know that you are prepared. We know that you're ready for the task ahead. As you go forward from this place, have a bias for action. You'll be colonels, soon to be colonels. Some of you are already colonels in this place, and you'll lead large formations. You'll be part of a big staff. You'll be thinking about big problems, and some of you may have a tendency to want to find a perfect solution. I would suggest to you don't. You'll want to have long discussions. I'll tell you don't. But I will tell you that leaders that have a bias to action and have their formations do the same are the ones that will solve problems and not just admire them. Action provides you with an opportunity. The opportunity provided in action is that you can find out if something's really going to work or not. And if you don't know what to do, just go with your instincts. Trust them. Learn to trust them. And you'll quickly find out if your instincts are any good at all and you'll quickly find out where you need to go next. You'll be able to adjust, but you've got to take a shot. Have principles that will govern your behavior. You've got to be disciplined. In my life, I often talk about my own personal vertical alignment. And for me, for me alone, it's my God, it's my family, then it's my business. The top of my vertical alignment also provides me left and right limits. The top of my vertical alignment also helps me to realize that I've got to be pursuing always something bigger than me. And it's that pursuit which keeps me in the right place. And I would strongly suggest to you that you've got to find something to govern your behavior so that you're not a mystery when you get out there and you start to lead. Don't be a mystery to the people that you lead. If you have principles, if something drives you every day to do the right thing, then what you'll find is that'll become the foundation which will allow your organization to be one that's rooted deeply in the trust of others. And it's trust within our institution, it's trust within our various organizations that drives us forward. It's also trust that says, I recognize that somebody needs me to be here to do what I'm supposed to do. Be confident. Have the courage to speak truth to power. But more importantly, have the confidence and the courage to speak truth to the powerless.
and for the powerless. Colonels truly run the Army. You'll be in a position to be the honest broker always. The Army needs you to never let something that is vital to a decision go unspoken. But the Army also counts on you to know when something is not vital to a decision and be quiet. You should have the confidence to ensure the truth is always put forward. The final decision may not go the way that you think, but you should always ensure that the truth is heard. And always remember that it will cost you to lead. Since I'm at this great institution of higher learning, as I said, I've got to mention a philosopher of sorts. And I want you to think about the story of Diogenes, 4th century BC philosopher. He was known to live a simple life. Unadorned, he carried around a lantern in broad daylight looking for an honest man. It's written that he would shine the light in people's faces as a commentary on the hypocrisy of the societal conventions. In today's language, I would say he was looking for fakers. I think the torch held by the fist in the mail glove, gift of the class of 14, you see here at the Army War College, is a great reminder of what shining lights can do and what they can represent for not only you, but for others. It can represent a light to expose all that is good in those that you lead. It can represent a light that guides others. Or like Diogenes, when you shine the light, it will help you find that honest person. So as you move on from here, think about Diogenes. And if you could stand up to his lantern and truly be an honest man or woman for those that you lead. I would tell you, be authentic. Don't be a faker. And as you sit unmoving in the chairs before me, you represent this potential energy that has the potential to do so, so very much. But as you explode out of those seats to come get your diploma, you have the power to give the absolutely most essential element. The building block of all life, I believe, is not carbon, but it's simply your ability, the potential that you have, to give others hope. So speak honestly. Know how to professionally speak truth to power and always speak for the powerless. Follow your governing principles. Have a bias for action. Be that honest man or woman that uses their lantern, their light, their torch to walk others out of the dark. Thank you. Strength and wisdom. Courage. Godspeed.